Many people have asked me to clarify what would amount to self-defense in the protection of your own home and your own family. Usually, of course, in the event that someone comes into your property unannounced, either to burgle it or worse, to attack people in your house. And of course, following on from that, what actions taken by you might amount to a criminal offence and charges brought against you as the householder for attacking someone coming into your home. That's what I'm talking about today. But first of all, if you're new to me, I'm a barrister who helps you understand law. So please hit that subscribe button and the bell icon, turn on the notifications so you don't miss out on future videos. Also, if you give the video a big thumbs up, that really does help this channel grow. So if you're a regular viewer of my channel, you know that I've spoken very often about self-defense and what self-defense means. So what better place to start than to start by talking about the principles of self-defense when defending your own home? Well, as I said, self-defense can be a full defense if it is successful, but it doesn't have to be proven by you. It has to be disproven by the prosecution if charges have been brought against you. What you must do as a defendant to any such charge is raise the defence of self-defence and then the burden shifts back to the prosecution to disprove certain things. The question that arises and needs to be addressed is set out in section 76 of the Criminal Justice and Immigration Act of 2008 and that is as follows. Section 76 1b provides that the question arises whether the degree of force used by the defendant was reasonable in the circumstances and those circumstances are what that defendant believes those circumstances to be. The defence can be used in the common law defence of self-defence, the common law defence of defence of property, and the defence is provided under section 3 of the Criminal Law Act of 1967. As to how the question of reasonableness should be decided, that is set out in section 76.3 of the Criminal Justice and Immigration Act 2008, and that reads as follows. The question whether the degree of force used by the defendant was reasonable in the circumstances is to be decided by reference to the circumstances as the defendant believed them to be, and subsections 4 to 8 also apply in connection with deciding that question. So the broad starting point is that the defendant must use reasonable force in the circumstances that he believed them to be. And this must be a genuinely held belief, even if that belief was mistaken. Although it's important to note that this doesn't apply if the mistake was due to intoxication, but more on that a little bit later. Now, the important bit when we talk about defending your own home when someone has broken in either to burgle or attack you, this has been weaved into this act in subsection 5a. Section 5a provides that in a householder case, the degree of force used by the defendant is not to be regarded as having been reasonable in the circumstances he believed them to be, if it was grossly disproportionate in those circumstances. Now this is a turn of phrase that many people have had difficulty with interpreting, and it has even found its way into the High Court on human rights issues, which is what I'm gonna come on to now. But just to contrast that wording for one moment, in subsection six, there's a very slight different use of words. Subsection six provides that in a case other than a householder case, the degree of force used by the defendant is not to be regarded as having been reasonable in the circumstances he believed them to be, if it was disproportionate in those circumstances. So the difference in the wording there, in most cases, it's going to be disproportionate in the circumstances, but in the householder case, it's been tweaked to be grossly disproportionate, and it's referred to in the negative. So it excludes the use of force being reasonable if it was grossly disproportionate in those circumstances. So this was the wording, among other things, under scrutiny in the court case of Collins in 2016, which you'll have no doubt heard of or read about in the media when the case decision was released. The brief facts of the case are these. In the early hours of the morning in December 2013, a householder, his wife, three children and three friends were at home. The householder, who we'll call D, had consumed a large quantity of alcohol and had fallen asleep whilst he was watching television. At around three o'clock in the morning, Collins entered the property through the unlocked front door and went upstairs. He was initially confronted by one of the three children who chased him back downstairs again. D, who was a 51-year-old builder weighing in at 15 and a half stone, was woken up and he too went downstairs. D forced Collins to the floor and into a headlock. Collins gave him a false name and said he was there to see the Queen. But D then found his wife's car keys in his pocket and police later found her mobile phone in his pocket. D restrained Collins in the headlock for around about six minutes until the police arrived, at which point he was no longer breathing. 
Paramedics were called and then he was quickly stabilised, but it suggested that there were permanent injuries as a result. The CPS decided not to prosecute D on their interpretation of Section 76, which was that in order to convict D, they would have to prove that the degree of force used by him in restraining Collins was grossly disproportionate. But this analysis was held to be fundamentally wrong, although it didn't change the outcome. But it did bring the question to the High Court for consideration, and in doing so, the High Court was able to set out and properly clarify what the test is for a householder self-defence. The court noted, as I said earlier in the video, that section 76.3 retains the common law standard for force that is permissible in self-defence, which is reasonable in the circumstances that the defendant believes them to be. However, the court took issue with the CPS interpretation in that it should not be whether or not the force used was proportionate, disproportionate, or grossly disproportionate rather whether it was reasonable in the circumstances. And in that case, as I said earlier, section 76.5 is drafted in the negative, which means it excludes that which is grossly disproportionate from being reasonable in householder cases. But it does not say anything about whether or not force that is not grossly disproportionate is reasonable. And this, the court said, depends on many factors, including the proportionality of the force to the envisaged threat. So therefore, the law on a householder case for self-defense could be summarized as follows. First of all, whether the degree of force used in a case is reasonable is to be considered with reference to the circumstances that the defendant believed them to be. This was the common law interpretation I've mentioned in section 76. Secondly, a householder case is not going to be regarded as being reasonable if the degree of force used was grossly disproportionate. Thirdly, that a degree of force that goes completely over the top on the face of it would be grossly disproportionate. Fourthly, however, to clarify that a householder may or may not be regarded as having acted reasonably in the circumstances if the degree of force used was disproportionate. So summarising this into a simple form of words, the difference between a normal self-defence case and a householder self-defence case, that is protecting your home, is one of the assessment of whether or not the level of force used was disproportionate. In a normal self-defence case, if your force is disproportionate, for example, meeting a fist with knives or meeting a knife with a gun, th those would be disproportionate. But in a householder case, being disproportionate so long as it is not grossly disproportionate, which I'll come back to in a moment, then that might still operate as a full defence of self-defence in a householder case. So actions that would be grossly disproportionate would be those that you would think of as going over the top or a calculated action or a calculated revenge. For example, if the intruder has been incapacitated and is lying on the floor and you proceeded to attack them with a weapon of some kind, that would be grossly disproportionate because they are incapacitated, the threat has been neutralised and they are no longer attacking you. Likewise, if they are running away and you give chase and then use a significant amount of force on them, that would be deemed to be over the top and grossly disproportionate because strictly speaking, you are no longer defending yourself. Although it is right to say that you can use reasonable force to recover items that have been stolen from you. So broadly speaking, acting out of some kind of malice or revenge or intentionally inflicting some kind of punishment when the threat has been neutralized or the intruder has already run away, those kind of things are going to be grossly disproportionate and self-defense will not operate as a defense. So I hope this helps to clarify that you are in a position where you are permitted to defend your house and home and family, but only to the level that doesn't cross that threshold of being grossly disproportionate. And that would include things, as I've mentioned, such as trapping somebody, deliberately hurting somebody after they are already incapacitated or running away. But in householder cases, self-defense can still operate even if the level of force used is disproportionate. So I hope you found that video useful. Please give it a thumbs up if you like this content and remember, stay humble and subscribe.